Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Super Show podcast. I'm your host for this week, Jamie. Um, and hey, I've got to warn you right from the off, in the interest of honesty and transparency and just making sure that we keep nothing from you, our audience, um, I think I have to warn you in telling you you're about to hear possibly the most scuffed episode uh, in this podcast history. And that's, well, partly because I'm running on around two hours sleep, partly because all the news we've got to discuss is bad news, but there is one single thing that will make this show actually worth listening to, and that is the presence of my good friend and yours, the future host of what I presume is the soon-to-be smash it podcast, Too Old, Too White, Too Male, is Mr. Alex Jones. Welcome, buddy. Hello. How the hell are you doing, mate? Two hours oh. sleep. Yeah, well, that was actually sad. It's more like four, but no one ever... That's one of those things that no one's ever honest about, ever in their life. You ask anyone how much sleep they got last night, whether they got too much or too little, they will exaggerate it. Anyone tells you they didn't sleep last night, they probably got five hours. <laughs> that's definitely true. You can never just be honest, can you? You have to give it some silly amount. Like, I was going to say then, I had about 12 hours sleep last night, but that's not true. I had about 10. Yeah, so. exactly. If, if everyone was literal with their assessments of their sleep, I reckon 60 to 70% of the adult population of the world would be suffering from some form of insomnia. That's my official scientific declaration. Especially when you get people that say, I haven't slept in four days, and you're like, well, you have, haven't you? You've yeah. had a little nap. Exactly, exactly. And Josie, I will say actually up front that I do hope you actually be getting as much sleep as possible, because obviously uh, you weren't able to join us this week, last week, excuse me, because um, you were, you were. I, I believe you, the, the official sort of medical declaration is you were shitting your arsehole off or out, or like, did was there any prolapsing? Or? I think I think both. Um, no, no, no prolapsing, although that, you know, I'm not sure if you'd want to know if there was, but, uh, yeah. no. So off, off the back of, um, having COVID about six weeks ago, uh, started to feel like I was getting recovered and then, hey, lucky me, everyone in my house caught norovirus, which was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, then, so then couldn't be here last week, which, which sucked. Uh, I would love to have been here last week, but I wasn't. I was ill again, and I'm sort of still recovering. Yeah. Uh, from from that and the and the uh, the COVID that recovery is ongoing. That bitch that keeps on giving. But yeah. getting there. I slowly mean, but surely, it's the worst luck imaginable. But I think I speak uh, not just for myself, but also on behalf of all the audience when I say it is great to see you back on the podcast. And it's just great to have your voice in my ears again, even if it is via headphones. I, I, it's good you, to be back. I yeah. feel like I'm, I feel like my voice is all messed up now. They're like permanently oh, kind of no. raspy. But um, yeah, no, it's not too. Bad. If anything, it adds character. You're just it, like you're right. beginning your transition into an old, smoking, gravelly voiced sort of I don't know old yes. country singer. Like a is that maybe I'm, I'm Johnny just, Cash? Yeah, I, I, yeah, like somewhere between Johnny Cash and John Wayne, just with less racism. Ideally, like but then you know I'll leave that up to you. But then with too old, too white, too male. Uh, you know, that's maybe that's what's expected. So. Exactly. But you know, who knows, by the end of this run of the Super Show, you might have no choice but to launch that podcast. Not just because that's the corner you've worked yourself into, but just because the money-making potential on a bad boy like that. On Patreon, probably through the roof. Until the alt-right I'm, get kicked off Patreon. Well, I'm just going to say that it wasn't. I wasn't there when it actually uh, was the idea was formulated, obviously, because it was last week. Yeah. But um, yeah, when Chris said it, it was definitely, uh, I could imagine that being a podcast that would that would pop up. At I saw, I, yeah, I, I saw that you, the, you left the comment on last week's video and that's where I drew inspiration from. I thought, you know yes. what, that's a little throwback. Um, and hey, the reason I was able to read that comment was because Jonesy left it in the comment section on last week's uh, podcast on YouTube, which is one of the many places which this podcast is hosted. If you wanted to watch it in video format, if you wanted to see our faces, and as I mentioned, join in the discussion in the comment section down below, you're more than welcome to do that. You can also join in the discussion on Social media, for example. On Twitter, you can find us at Super Show Pod. You can send us questions. You can tag us in news stories that you think that we should be tuned in on. And I guess, and again, if you want to enjoy this podcast, absorb this podcast in other ways, I will also point you towards major podcasting platforms. You can choose which one you listen to it on. There's Spotify, there's iTunes, there's Google Podcasts, there's even more. Pick one, download it, stream it, rate it, don't rate it. Yeah it's really your choice. I'm not here to tell you how to consume the Super Show podcast. I'm just telling you it's there. And those aren't the only places either, because how could I not mention Paisley Radio 
The URL, if you want to check that out, paisleyradio.com. This very podcast that you're listening to right now is broadcast out on Thursdays at 10 p.m. And if you miss it, it repeats on Mondays. Long story short, um, if I'm ever chatting to any of you, whether it's on Discord, maybe we bump into each other on the street, very slim chance of that happening, I know, but I'm just throwing it out there. And you're not completely up to date to the minute of every piece of content we've ever produced, especially this podcast, then really you're running out of excuses. That's what I've got to say. Jonesy, where do you consume this podcast when you're not on it? That's an interesting um, question. I, so I like to do it on you. I like to watch it on YouTube because I get to see your little faces. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Also as where I'm, you know, you can comment. It's nice and easy to comment on there. Um, I've no, I have started to listen to other podcasts on Spotify though, more often, which I wasn't doing before. Cause obviously with Spotify, you can just listen as well. You don't have to watch, which is quite nice. And you can sort of turn your phone off and just stick it in your pocket. Yes. But, um, I, I must admit, I think the last time I wasn't on the podcast and caught up on it just to hear what you and Chris had been chatting about. I remember it was the episode just after you'd seen the uh, Snowpiercer. That was it. I was about to refer to right. it as the kind of American slash Korean film about the train. Uh, but I'm not sure how much that would have narrowed it down. And I remember I was listening to it on Spotify because I was actually at my dad's house at the time. And I thought, I don't know how I'd feel about me just staring at these two faces for two <laughs> hours. It's like, is this what the kids watch nowadays? Yeah, is, this, is this Fortnite? I think, is this Fortnite? Spotify is uh, probably the easiest one for that sort of stuff. But I do like um, being able to see it as well. I watch uh, with the Just Interesting guys. Yeah. I tend to watch that. Like on on YouTube as well. I don't actually. I don't. Do they do it on Spotify? They must do it on Spotify. Yeah, I, I'm sure they do. But I, I like, tend to yeah. watch their podcast uh, on YouTube as well because I like to. I like to see people's little faces and their reactions as they're chatting about stuff. I agree. I agree. Um, speaking of faces and reactions, do you know who else has a face? Oh, I mean that that's tough. There are so many faces out there. There are a lot of faces, billions of faces. Some might say. And hey, I'll put it to you, Jonesy that there could be, uh, I'm going to say 12 billion faces out there because that's how many people on planet Earth are two-faced. Do you get it? Oh, wow. Yeah, because you know, there's, you know, they're backstabbing and they're evil and you can't trust them. That is a lot of two-faced people. Yes, and one such two-faced person, if you believe the tweets of industry insider Lance McDonald, is, is podcast favourite, podcast hero, Hassan Karaman who, yes. courtesy of his own Blue Box Studios and their horror project, Abandoned, have been making headlines once again. And we kind of felt like we had to chime in on this because at this point, that's just like a, a, a podcast staple. It's a trademark. It, it is. We've mentioned it so much. I think the only game we mentioned um, more than that last year was probably uh, Marvel's Avengers. So I think it's uh, <laughs> it's one of, one of those things. It was that very close. Came. Yeah, if it pops up in the news, we have to talk about it, um, which is an interesting week because it was kind of a story, non-story, for sure. Yeah, but then that makes it a perfectly packaged thing to bring up before we actually get into the meat of the podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Just chat. So basically what Jonesy is referring to is, uh, as I mentioned, a number of tweets came out from, I guess I'd call him an industry insider, a guy called Lance McDonald. Um Industry Insider is a very polite term for a guy with 60,000 followers and an anime profile picture. I don't really know the full story, but there's something going on there. Um, he put out a series of tweets, uh, actually this morning at the time of recording, about Blue Box Game Studios that essentially called the development of Abandoned into question, um, with a little bit more force, a little bit more vigor than some of us had called into question in previous weeks and months. Uh, specifically, he called out the fact that the quote-unquote, playable demo, which they said they would release soon, has not been seen or heard from for three months now. They previously tweeted a lie about the reason the trailer app was six gigabytes being because it contained way more footage, and it just need but in fact, it actually just needed a small patch to fix a technical issue, which would have seen it go down to a more appropriate size. And he has also called them out for deleting tweets that would have essentially given us um, a more trackable timeline, if you will, for the kind of content that we should have been seeing at this point. Because for those of you who um, hadn't seen, we were promised a few other bits and pieces. One of the main things, that the, the main focus of what people are asking for is the reveal and release of Abandoned Prologue, 
And I've got, I've got to be honest, yes. Josie, do you even remember what Abandoned Prologue is? Because I don't I know that I do. I think that was the playable, uh, like a playable demo, or was like an in-engine playable demo, wasn't it? Or something like that, that they were talking about. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, double checking on, um, there's an article here that I was reading before. Um so they they had a playable prologue, which they which they said people would be able to play through the app, which was on the PlayStation Store, which everyone downloaded. Um, but they it seems they've deleted tweets linked to that, suggesting mm. that it was going to come out. And you know there was a yeah, like you said, there was a time frame attached to it. Um, but, to, but to be honest, everything they've done so far, like deleting tweets and you know nothing being released, it just goes more and more toward the point that. Blue Box Games Studios is exactly what everyone should have assumed it was, which was just a small indie dev that were massively overselling what they had. And, yes. You know, no surprise that they it's taken them a lot longer to do what they wanted to do. It's, this, it's the way of the world when it comes to these small it's companies. It's true. So. And they've also, and again, whether they actually are conscious of this and it's something they factor into the decisions they make, you'll never know. But they've got that safety net, whether they feel like they placed it there or not, of whenever they do something strange or fishy or something that's just going to draw at first eyeballs and then uh, a later point headlines, the people who got fully on board with the conspiracy angle of this, you know, the people who might on some level still think Hideo Kojima's involved or still think that Silent Hills or Konami is involved somehow, they eat this shit up because they see yes. deleted tweets and they're like, well, it's, you know, it's all part of the ARG. You know, now I just saw the Batman the other day and he's got some sort of Zodiac style stuff going on where he's creating, you know, ciphers that have to be decoded. And I can see people go, like go through the Hassan Karaman's personal Twitter being like, there's got to be a cipher here. He's telling us where the body is. Yeah, there's that thing with conspiracy theories, isn't there, where which is the same kind of thing as people who buy into like the ARG stuff with this and is it is it Kojima in that um, any like a lack of evidence is evidence. So the more mm. that they see stuff um, sort of pointing to it not being Kojima, it just it's just proof that it's part of the conspiracy and it's how deep it goes. It goes even deeper because they're covering up more stuff and da 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 da, -da. Um, Which, yeah, so you're right. It's just fuel for the fire no matter what they do at this point. Yeah, although one thing that maybe uh, douses that flame ever so slightly is the fact that uh, while we do have an actual statement on Twitter from Blue Box Studios, Hassan Karaman has also been tweeting from his personal account, in some cases even appearing to sort of go get into slight back and forth with some people. So some of his tweets are just sort of to be expected, claiming that they deleted previous tweets because they may cause confusion, confusion with information regarding an upcoming patch um, and also claiming and reiterating that a patch and the release of the pro prologue are still being worked on. But there's one interesting bit here where he essentially gets into, maybe it's a stretch to call it an argument, but I'm going to call it an argument with like a, a music artist who claimed to make music for Abandoned um, until they basically uh, stopped being responded to by Hassan and Blue Box. And Hassan himself kind of, got involved saying we never signed a contract it was never official you just made a request i told you that it might be used but instead it didn't um all very messy the the horrible thing for uh blue box i think at this point must be they have a captive audience and it's big for the you know a, a small indie dev they must just be trying to figure out how the hell they can monetize the attention they've got um before it all just dissipates so like that must be the only consideration they're going through at the moment um, and I kind of feel sorry for them at this point. Like even like this, like arguing with people online about you know providing assets or providing music or whatever must be a real. It's the sort of thing that normally it wouldn't come to light. It wouldn't be that you know, yeah. talked about. But everything they do at this point is just in the public space, and everyone finds it interesting. So exactly, yeah, it must suck for them at, at some point. But but hey, they did foster it. They did make it worse. They definitely played up to it in the beginning. So totally, totally. Which, yeah. again, you know, there is, a, like, as you've said, there is a bit of a what goes around comes around kind of feeling to a lot of this stuff. Not that I want Hassan to suffer, you know, any actual real sort of tangible stress or woes, be them like financial or otherwise. Because um, at the end of the day, I, the, the feeling I've always got from Hassan is that I think ultimately he just wants to be a vessel for love. Um, and I think if we learn anything this week, it's that. At your highest moment, that's where you have to be careful because that's when the devil comes for you. And I think that's really, that's the Hassan Karaman story in a nutshell, right? Is, you know, he got it's to that very, high point. It's very true. And when you are someone who loves that much and you just want to put that love out there, you know, 
Sometimes yeah. it's hard to control your emotions and, and how you react. Exactly. In fact, I, I actually heard a report um, not that long ago that someone actually went up to Hassan in between his tweets and asked him to leave Twitter, and he refused. Um, clearly, he still felt, <laughs> still felt like he had something to say, something to share. Amazing they just let him stay as well. Usually yeah. Twitter are quite good at... Um, Tell it, you know, when they tell you to go, then they get rid of you. But you know, I guess in this instance, they were like, "No." Can, well, I let, you know, can we stop? I, I want to stop talking about. I know the rest of the world has probably spoken about and thought about and read about to hell and back everything that happened um, last weekend. But we haven't. You and I, whether on this podcast or just offline, away from Discord, haven't had a chance to talk about this at all. I saw you tweeting about. For anyone that's not, you know, catching up and isn't religious like Jones and I am, we're talking about Will Smith. We're talking about Chris Rock. We're talking about the Oscars because it's hard not to. Okay, it's hard. It gaming hard podcasts or otherwise, it's hard not to. You tweeted something out. You thought. <laughs> you, what did you say that Chris Rock should sue him? No, no, he should sue the Academy. I should I sue the Academy. What? Because it's. In a, so, okay, look, it was insane. Like, at first I thought it was... So I thought the slap was f was fake when I very first saw it. Yes. Because the way, you know, like, and I think a lot of people have said it, the way that he throws the slap does almost seem like a bit of a hot, like a movie slap. Um, yeah. It's got a very short wind-up. It's very it's very quick. And Chris Rock does a big old reel from it. And the, the follow-through is much bigger than the actual slap. So it's, it, I thought, oh, it's a bit fake. The point at which he then sits down and starts screaming at Chris Rock from his seat was the point at which I was like, oh, this is not fake. Yeah. I think he's had some reaction. Is, this is completely real. Um, and it was, it's weird seeing very wealthy people who are usually the, the, you know, the very good at putting on a face for the public, just losing it and just going back to like normal everyday people. And he's like screaming at Chris Rock about, keep my... Fucking yeah. wife's name at your mouth. I was like, that, "Wow, that's a that's something I didn't expect to see Will Smith saying um, on the Oscars." Yeah, like watching that clip the, for the first time. I, I, again, at this point, as you said, in any other context, a sort of relatively minor, depending on how you interpret it, act of violence, although an act of violence all the same, followed by you know some expletives and raised voices isn't all that noteworthy. I could walk past something like that happening in a tube station and I wouldn't bat an eye. I wouldn't take my headphones out. I wouldn't stop to find out what the argument was about. But it, but it was something about seeing figures like that in a venue or a forum like that um, that was just kind of weirdly startling. And I had the exact same reaction. It was when he was sat back down and, you know, the, you know, the, the lip was trembling a little bit. And you, can, you know when you can look at someone's face and see the anger, like, seething, like, emanating yeah. and off them, like pulsating from them. And I was like, Jesus Christ, he's not happy. This is real. Um, at least that was, again, my interpretation. But some people don't think it is still. I thought Chris Rock actually handled it pretty well. Um, I think the way that he... Like, you, you, can, you can have questions around, like, the, a lot of the stuff. Because this is what's weird. People have come out afterwards and they've been like, oh, no, you can't say that, uh, you know, about someone with... Um, well, she, she's got, like, alopecia, alopecia or yeah. They're like, oh no, you can't, you know, if you say that about somebody um, with something like that, then you should uh, you should expect it. We're like, no, you shouldn't. Like, the America have a really weird thing about like roasting people anyway, which we don't have in the UK anywhere near as much. Like, roasting is not. A th like, I don't enjoy it. I know some people do, but I've always found it strange. But they do it all the time. Like Ricky Gervais was hired years and y years after years to do the Golden Globes specifically because he insulted all the celebrities there. And surprise, surprise, other people have followed in a similar vein. Yeah. And this is why I said, when I tweeted, I said, like, I feel I feel really sorry for Will Smith. Like, that's a horrible position to be in. Just because someone wants to roast people, wants to have a go at people in the audience, doesn't mean you should be subjected to it. He's touching on a touchy subject. For one, Will Smith and Jada are in a weird-ass place anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Jesus. Oh. It, Anyone who hasn't seen the Will Smith series that, that came out on YouTube, I think you should go watch it. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was where he was trying to lose weight for a role, but he's obviously a dude who's got a lot of demons, not just in his past, but his present as well. Um, it, um, I can't stand Jada Pinkett Smith these days, purely because of like, what she's done to Will Smith. She's broken him. She has <laughs> done something to that man. 
That, that picture anyway. from that one video where they're clearly having some kind of interview, almost more of an intervention than an interview. The round table and to, thing. Yeah, and talking about the nature of their open relationship and like that it's face he's pulling in that one open, still. Open, yeah. like one-sided open relationship yeah, exactly. where she's boning how whoever she wants. Fuck? And all the, all, I can't tell you how many tweets I saw uh, that were like, that the tweet would be how Jada would have reacted if uh, Chris Rock had made a, jo- a similar joke about Will Smith, and they're all just gifts of people fooling over themselves, laughing. <laughs> and yeah, I wonder if there's an element of truth there. I don't, well, I don't know. But then, but what I yeah, the reasons why I tweeted and said like, well, I think Chris Rock, uh, when the Academy didn't kick him out, it now transpires from like today, I think that the yeah. Academy has said they asked Will Smith to leave, and he just said no. Yes, that, and I it's like that's well accurate. then. Okay, then then eject him. And Jim Carrey actually uh, was was interviewed recently on a, sh- a show in America, and he said he thought it was um, I can't remember the words he used, but basically said he thought it was pretty disgusting that not only was he not kicked out, but then forty five minutes later, everyone in the room gave him a standing ovation. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think yeah. he should have been awarded the Oscar that night. I think they should have said, given what's happened, we're not going to do the Oscar tonight. Um, but look, he's been asked to leave. But then they're in a really difficult position, which is that, like, I, I can't remember the way it works, but, you know, as we saw a couple of years ago with um, La La Land and Moonlight, like, clearly they, there are weird situations when it comes to who is allowed to know who's won Oscars beforehand and how much of it is kept a secret. And you've got to kind of got the second guess yourself where, okay, he's the front runner for this thing, but he might not necessarily win it. And imagine if we suspended this one award because he's a nominee and then the other guy, someone else would have won it and he could have had his moment on stage. And it's tricky. Like I, so, so maybe maybe I then can, then it kick him out, then kick him out, announce the award, say Will Smith won it, but then because of the events, he's not there to pick it up. Collecting the award be, on behalf of Will Smith, GI Jane Two Zone, Jada Pink, it's Chris Rock, no <laughs> Chris Rock, it's Chris Rock. Oh man, it was so it was so uncomfortable. Like I can't watch cringe and stuff like that any, yeah. anyway, and it was too real. And I yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those things that I like. I as kind of like what you said, I've got a real shrinking appetite for a certain type of cringe. I, I can watch scripted or planned cringe, like a lot of people I know. Like if you look at like the, the UK version of The Office, for example, I'm still completely fine with that. But there are certain things, a lot of reality TV shows, like people singing badly, weirdly enough. Oh, yeah. Um, like a lot of that stuff I just really struggle with nowadays. I don't know what it is about adulthood that's <laughs> changed me in that way because I used to eat it up. And now, yeah, I... But but at the same time, I'm kind of glad it happened because how crazy was that 24 hours where you woke up yeah. and it felt like the single biggest um, entertainment oriented news story of the year had just happened. The the first tweet I saw about it was, um, and I didn't know anything else, was someone saying, "How has no one slapped Ricky Gervais yet?" And I thought, like, what? What's happened? Has someone done? Has he done something? And then I had to go on a big like Twitter hunt to find out what had happened. Mm. And when I saw what happened, I was like, oh my god, what? Because like yeah. one thing I couldn't understand was how is there no security like stopping people getting on stage? I, 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 it it kind of goes back to what you were saying about how they didn't really do anything. I reckon that the people who organised that shit and the people who make decisions at the moment were just dumbfounded because you think about security for just about every event you possibly plan, but when the only people who in, in, like, who have the ability who can actually walk up the staircase and access the stage are the likes of Will Smith. You probably don't think you need an extra like fence or velvet rope or or even security. Like, what would a security guard could have done? Would have have done if he was there and Will Smith started walking onto stage? Get in does, front does of him. He, does he get held back? Because then that's like yeah. a whole situation in itself. Now, nah, of course he does. He has to. You don't get special treatment just because you're like. He did get you... special treatment. We... In... No, he <laughs> did. They asked he did, him to leave. They... He said no, and they're like, ah, yeah, all right. I think the next award show you're going to see security. Oh, who's next? I guess it won't be till next year now, right? In terms of the big, big three. Yeah, it's gonna. But there will be. Actually, I think there'll be security. Either that, or you won't have jokes like that. You won't have like roasting jokes anymore. And Will Smith will have not only put on the biggest night for a award show, he would have ruined it going forward because you won't have Ricky Gervais and people like that doing sort of like taking the piss out of people. Which is the last thing those award shows need because they they feel so dated and drawn out as it is. If you're actually taking comedy out of the situation, like what more do you have to... Basically, I think the only way that the Oscars can kind of claw this back and I think 
run improved numbers next year is if we turned into Jeff Keighley's Oscars and every single 30 seconds, instead of giving out an award, like take your hand Zimmers and your fucking your coders and shove them up your ass. All I want to hear is world premiere every 30 seconds. That's what they don't have enough of at the Oscars is trailers for hot new products. I see. I think they go the Jake Paul way and they have an octagon just off stage, just on stage, off stage. And anyone who gets beef just gets funneled into that and they can actually have a celebrity fight oh. like there and then. See, again, we're sat here, you know, on a Thursday evening coming up with hot new ideas for how to reinvent a product. You know, they're sat around probably, you know, doing nothing, feeling sorry for themselves. Um, and that's why we're, we're the real go-getters in this situation, Jonesy. We are indeed, mate. We are. Uh, speaking of go-getters, we have a particular comment of the week that we wanted to highlight from one go-getter in question who goes by the name One Tip Wonder. And can, I, can I read this one out? Because I picked this because I, I appreciated the comment. I would actually love it if you read it out because it's about me. Uh, so yeah, the comment comes in from One Tip Wonder and says, Wow, Jamie, you're on a roll. That was a great analogy between Dying Light 2 and F1 tyre grip. And I completely agreed because last week you did an an- or you, you used an analogy to um, describe how you haven't really found that you're sticking with Dying Light Two because it doesn't feel like the game is is kind of sticking with you in a way that. And the analogy you used was that in F1, when you have grip and you need a lot of grip to sort of stick to the track and you know go faster in corners and stuff, and you were finding a little little grip with Dying Light Two, you weren't being held on the game. You were sliding off, um, and it wasn't quite working for you. And yeah. I completely understood what you mean. I think it was a great analogy. I think a lot of games um, fall foul of this for me. Um, Dying Light 2 is one of them, maybe not to the degree that you found, but sure. sometimes there's just certain elements in a game or, or story or like, you know, a whole load of things that just don't quite jive with you and you can't get that traction to keep you coming back for more. And when you, and it always, it seems with me, it seems to boil down to a point where I sit down and I think, I really want to play something. And then I think, what am I going to play? And then I look at a game that I've been playing and go, nah. Yeah. That, like, and I think that's the grip, that's the grip thing. You're not sticking to it. You're not trying, you're not thinking, oh yeah, I've got to play more of that. Yeah. And, and you just almost kind of like, in my mind, sort of took it to another level for me, which is that when, again, for anyone that doesn't, you know, watch or follow F1, like it, it, it's not all that heady, but like one of the things I will say is that as, kind of as you just pointed out, you don't get radio messages being shared on the F1 broadcast of a driver going, oh, I just want you guys to know the grip is great. Like when it, when something's good and when you're jiving with something and it's working and it's the thing you want to play, it's the reason you're turning your PlayStation on. You know you want to play it before you've stepped over there. You almost don't make a note of that. There is no kind of like, you know, the, you, it's just sort of second nature. But it doesn't it's need when, to be said, right, yeah. Exactly, but it's when you don't have that grip that all, all of a sudden everything kind of like fades into, um, it sort of comes into a much sharper view. Um, and it's it's an ugly place to be in, you know, when when your desire to turn the PlayStation on comes before your desire to choose the game to play and you're sat on the dashboard scrolling through the icons and being like, I know which game I should play. I know which game I feel like I have an obligation to play, but I kind of don't want to play it. Yes. No, absolutely. I, I mean, I've had that feeling a lot of times. Um, I think I, dying, I, I don't think I've got it as much with Dying Light 2 as you have in that I've found it more enjoyable, I think, from um, what you were saying. Or that, But I completely understand in the sense of with that game specifically, I can feel the constituent parts and some t- and often mm. those constituent parts aren't aren't as good as I think they could be. And I think when you can when you're not just like in a flow and playing a game and you can sort of feel the different bits of a game, it kind of makes you lose the immersion a bit. Um, which definitely pulls like goes toward grip and like wanting to stick with something. Um and it yeah, it's 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 not quite as sticky for me as dying like one, for example. Um, yeah. I'm hoping to get back to it. I've, uh, as I was saying a couple of weeks ago, I've, I've found it quite tricky to play games recently. Like I've I've not really been in the right headplace, like not feeling well and stuff. It's, it's, it's not something I've wanted to do. I've just watched crap tons of Netflix. <laughs> um, but I, I'm hoping to get back to Dying Light 2 um, and to uh, Horizon Forbidden West when I'm feeling a bit better. Yeah. No, I, I feel the same way. I'm hoping to get back to it too. I also have not managed to play any of it in the last week because 
uh, something else has come up, which I will uh, be talking about shortly. And I will also take the opportunity, Jonesy, shortly to ask you about your adventures into Netflix, because I'm sure for as much as you try and play them down, there are some good stories to be told. But before we get to that, I do just want to give a quick shout out to the people who actually make this podcast possible. And those are our ever supporting patrons over on patreon.com forward slash super show. For those of you who don't know, this is a podcast that, let's be honest, is basically entirely funded by Patreon at this point. Um, They are the people who keep the lights on and make it so that we can come back week after the week delivering whatever the fuck this is to you into your eyes and or ears uh if you do head over to patreon.com forward slash super show first of all thank you but what you will see when you head over there is a bunch of different tiers that you can uh pledge to you know, various amounts of money for and you will find various rewards awaiting you at those various tiers. For example, for just $2 a month, you can gain access to our Discord, where Chris, Jonesy, and I all hang out, and we chat, and we answer questions, and our DMs are open, and so on and so forth. And then so on, you get there's a $5 tier, $10, and so on, and you'll find you know, patron-exclusive podcasts, you'll find behind-the-scenes videos, you'll find... You know, little one-off things we've done that we actually probably should come back to, like known murderers and all that kind of good stuff. That's all waiting for you once again over at patreon.com forward slash super show. Uh, we want to give a, a big thank you to all the people who have already gone over there and are already pledging their support. There are some names on screen right now. Thank you all so much to them. And further to that, a special shout out to Aaron Cameron, Athletic Gravy, Brimstone, Cole K, Helium Joker, I Snort Rock Salt, Jesper Camdell Nielsen, Leo Merger, Mindful Pig, Mr. Anthropic, Nathan Pierce, Neil Hashtag Daniel, Pastors Guild, Scary Omen, Starful Kid, The Ballless Beauty, The Gorgeous Gelding, Geldling, Gelding, The Perfectly Symmetrical Stunner, The One and Only, Mark Clancy, and finally, of course, we have the big dogs, the ones that really sit tight, sit firmly in our back pockets. Brett Z, Doppler, Geometric Potter, Hacksaw Bookread, Manuel Guerrero, Peaswad, and The Uncaged. Guys, thank you all so much. Wow, what an honour it is. Thank you, guys. It is indeed. Um, yeah, so yeah, that link once again, patreon.com forward slash super show if you want to go and check that out. Moving on though, Jonesy, couldn't help but notice you mentioned Netflix. I'm sort of, I, saw, I, re- I realized I said Netflix, and then the one thing I've binged is not, even Netflix. <laughs> is not Netflix. It's Prime. So I shouldn't it's have said Prime. That. It's Prime. Do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking fire a shot here, and you're gonna have to tell me how it feels. I think Prime is fast becoming the worst of the uh, streaming services in terms of what it <laughs> offers me. In uh, where, you know where I am in my life. Okay. It's it's a it's a weird one. It's not great. I mean, I think the mixture of the fact that there are so many shows on there you can pay for, um, mixed with kind of a, a lot of lackluster stuff and often not as good offerings as you're going to get on Netflix. It is a bit of a strange one. But um, for me, there have been a few shows recently that have been you know that tick boxes for me, uh, like Picard. Um, this is one that I've uh, I need to get back onto because I haven't watched it for a while. But there's I think there's some new some new series and things on there. Um, but the one that I've been watching um, this week and I've watched all of it in one week was Upload, um, which isn't a gaming uh, show particularly, right? But um, it is so it's a near future sci fi um, kind of like a co- comedy. Um, Oh, what's the? I'm trying to think of like a, similar to there's a Black Mirror episode where people can upload themselves their digital consciousness to like an afterlife. Oh right, um, okay. And that's bits exactly of, what, little bits of um, altered carbon and a bit of Cyberpunk 2077 in there too. Exactly, exactly. So what happens in this is when you're go, when you're about to die, um, you can have your head vaporized and you can have your consciousness uploaded into. Um, into a uh, a server, basically a, d- a digital server, and you have an avatar, and then you live on the server. Um, and it's a lot of wealthy people uh, at the start of the show, anyway, who, who live in this one place called um, uh, what's it called, Lakeview, I think it's called. Um, and they're all really wealthy, and they pay a load of money to go on there. But the thing I like about it is that there's a lot of jokes that work with like the gaming community. So things right. like in-app purchases, bugs, having to buy outfits. Uh, people doing like silly dance moves and stuff. There's a lot of like gaming crossover. Nice. Um, and there's also, it's because uh, there's a lot of like VR crossover because when people in the real world want to visit a dead person, they can put on a pair of VR goggles and they can cli- go inside and they can go and talk to them and see them. Um, 
yeah, it's 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 funny. It's it's deep in places. There's some romance there. There's some like yeah. There's, there's jokes. Uh, no, yeah, <clears throat> I enjoyed it. It's, genre it's not, spanning. Genre spanning. It's not perfect. Um, it's also got some interest, like interesting side stuff about just futuristic. Uh, things like self-driving cars, uh, printable food, which I really like. I love all that sort of futurism coming into shows because um, it's you know you can imagine what it's going to be like yeah. in the near future. D- d- does it try and sort of uh, pose or, or 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 tackle any kind of moral quandaries that exist with all that stuff? Like, are there people in the show who object to having their sort of their consciousness or their personalities uploaded into the ether, or does it not wade into? Is it not that kind of show? Do you know what? It skirts those <coughs> issues and some of those are the are main plot points about, oh, there's people who don't like people that upload themselves, but mm. actually it does it in the most, like, you know, least probing way possible. It doesn't deal with any deep philosophical issues, kind of like, you know, Star Trek in, back in the day would deal with what happens when you teleport and there's a copy of you teleported and there's a copy of you here. Like, mm. who's the real person? It doesn't really deal with any of that sort of stuff. I think it may do going forward when into season three, which is going to be released next year, apparently. Um, but it, it tries to steer clear of a lot of that. Like it, it goes for the low hanging fruit, moreover, like there's the Luds who want to destroy um, the ability to upload because they don't like, they're like, no, we believe in Jesus. And they just want to go, they don't believe in it. And then you've got the, the rich people and, and there's a bit of a, uh, you know, oh, the, the rich are the bastards who are uploading themselves and they're just going to come back down. And, that, and once they've, been in there for a number of years they're going to get technology so they can go back into a body again and they're just going to come be rich bastards again there's a lot of that mm. like low hanging fruit it doesn't it doesn't get too philosophical um well it, it, it does a little bit but not not really but yeah we, but i suppose it is a comedy and it is trying to um it's trying to be humorous at the same time so I yeah think the, it doesn't want to stray too far down that path um they, so this because there's, in the first episode i was i was like what are they going to do if they upload the guy and then he doesn't die? Which is, you know, a typical like philosophical problem of then you've got two ber- versions or what are they going to do about the his body? Like, you know, how do they, what are they going to do? But then I like the fact they just vaporise your head the second they right. upload you. They va- so they're like, that's how they get around it. They're is like, it no, specifically just the head? It just turns to dust? Yeah. Oh, huh, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, that the works. Bod- the body's still there. Um but then do they not just have an issue where they have just shit tons of headless bodies to deal with? Yes. They must cremate them all or something. Uh, well, they, do, they later on in the episode, you do actually see that some of the bodies are kept and they have heads re- cloned and they're trying to figure out how to put people back into their heads. Huh. Um, but unsuccessfully. Weird. I don't know why. Like, it, it's nothing to do with it at all. I, it, I don't even know that I could actually, uh, like pick out a single similarity but for some reason like hearing you describe that reminded me did you ever see the matt damon film downsizing uh it's the one where basically in the future they create technology that is able to shrink humans down to the size of like pocket-sized humans and because the you know the, the, we're putting such a strain on the planet we're taking up so much space and housing's difficult and and energy and it's, you know, it's crises everywhere no the i haven't US, I don't think I have the us government it basically incentivized people to downsize and to allow themselves to be shrunk and live in these mini people societies because it's so much more efficient and less taxing on the planet and there's a scene where they um they go to like that the was... bank and they and the te- the lady that they're speaking to like the representative from the downsizing program is like yeah your four hundred thousand dollars will be worth forty million dollars in downsizing because that, that's how they try and incentivize you like if you allow yourself to be six inches tall you'll be rich in this mini mini environment like <laughs> I so I do this weird thing that I'm sure I mean let me know in the comments down below other people if you do that out there there are so many trailers for things these days that I often see trailers. And then I don't know if I've seen the real thing. And I think I have, but I've actually only seen the trailer. And I think this is one where I've watched the trailer a few times. Very possibly. But actually haven't seen the film. Because the trailer's better than the movie. The trailer right. makes it look like a like a sort of a quirky kind of fun movie where that's the central thing. And I think the final movie is actually far more... It's It's got more of a love story um, than right. the trailer would have you believe. I think it's got a lot more, in some people's opinions, almost overbearing sort of environmentalist themes, which I think were kind of inherent to the whole idea. But um, yeah, that's like, the, that's like the modern day version of not being sure if you can actually remember something or if it was just a, you just saw a photo of it and that <laughs> you made the memory out of the photo. 
Yeah, yeah, seeing a trailer and not not being sure whether you binged it or not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. Um, but no, hey, I recommend Upload. And if um, uh, if anyone out there is like me, likes a bit of soft sci-fi, likes a bit of um, quirky humour, um, because oh, I've been trying to steer clear of like anything too rigorous. I've just been like going, you know, totally. lowest common denominator um, while I've been sort of uh, on the mend. Um, and actually, to that end, I also reinstalled Apple Arcade because I wanted some... I wanted to play some like chill phone games um, and I did actually manage to get hold of uh, a chill phone game, which um, Alto's Odyssey, The Lost City, mm. uh, which I've played actually quite a lot of now, which is a pretty um, little run arcade game on your phone where you are a snowboarder kind of thing, but not on snow, on like sand and water and all different environments where you just sort of glide along the levels and you uh, can jump and s- rotate in air and like land jumps in order to build up speed um, and collect things around the world and dodge rocks. And yeah, that's been quite a nice little chill arcade game to sort of um, dip into. It's I've done it, a little bit of gaming. But it's really interesting that you mentioned Alto's Odyssey because it, it, that taps into, I remember like this was about six months to a year ago, I actually had an idea for a YouTube video that I was going to maybe potentially write or explore um, about Apple Arcade that honed in on exactly that kind of title. Because I don't know if you noticed it looking through the games that were available, but when Apple Arcade launched, it was kind of this thing of we're approaching developers, we're approaching you know independent studios, we're trying to get unique and new games on board, we're trying to create experiences that are made for iPhones and that are you know and you know they, they don't have any microtransactions and they can be played offline and you pay this fee and you know that everything you download for Apple Arcade is kind of like safe and it's a game and that's self-contained and at some point the speed at which they were adding sort of new original titles to the service slowed down dramatically and they went on this whole new direction where they started going back going to and clearly approaching developers of classic iPhone games and getting them to like remaster or polish up their games and release them on Apple Arcade. So, like, Alto's Odyssey is one. I'm try- I'm going to forget them all now that I'm saying it, but, like, I know Angry Birds, they did it. Do you remember yeah. Cut the Rope? They did yep. it for They did it for Cut the Rope. Um, like, I'm pretty... Uh, it must, I think they did it for that... that, that the that, that jetpack one, I forget its name. The one where you're... The, the tiny wings where you control the birds oh, yeah, that yeah. have the time, the jumps on the hills. They basically went to all the classic games from, like, you know over the last 10, 15 years that, you know, I'm sure different generations of people remember different ones and were like, hey, can you re- remaster this and do a microtransaction-free version of that classic original game and put it on arcade? And it, I just thought it was genius. And all of a sudden, like, I was playing... They even put um, Game Dev Story on there, which is I, I, right. one of my one of my favourite iOS games, favourite mobile games for, of all time. Um, just a genius move. And I, I, I had an idea for a video. It was called, like... Apple Arcade's frustratingly genius revival or something like that. It's stupid YouTube name, like proper fucking video essay, pretentious bullshit. Hence why <laughs> I didn't write it. But um, it's, it's a good idea though. Like I, it's funny you say that because I all those those games I saw all on Apple Arcade because I literally had the thing of I didn't want to go and get download a game that was going to throw a whole bunch of microtransactions at me. I just wanted yeah. to be able to sit and play a game. And yeah, and I, I saw, and I, I was actually surprised that um, so many of those old school titles were on there because I hadn't seen when you'd seen, obviously, that they'd started to do that. Um, but that, but that's often what I, what I want on my phone. I don't want, like, buy this, pay that. I don't want to have to sit through ads every yeah. 10 seconds in order to play a game. I just want to be able to not think about it, play the game, enjoy the game. Um, and so, yeah, no, I agree with you. Genius move. Very well I've, I found a, so Monument Valley 2, Bloons TD6+, Plus, Bridge Constructor, um, I'm just picking out ones that I definitely remember the name of. Kingdom Rush Frontiers, Tiny Wings, Crossy Road, Jetpack Joyride, uh, Fruit Ninja, uh, Game Dev Story, like I mentioned, Monument Valley, the original one, Badland, uh, Threes, The Room 2, uh, Mini Metro, Reigns. So just like, and like I mentioned, the other ones in there that I didn't see on that list, but I know are in there like Angry Birds and Cut the Rope. Just like classic old school proper addictive iOS games, and like you said, just brought back with no bullshit. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, do you know what I've been playing, Jonesy? Uh, you- no. What have you been playing? I know you. You said you've been. You've put a, a pin in a few games, so because uh, you had something new to play. 
Yes, I did. I do have something new to the, to play because it's funny. I was at, I was talking to Chris this time last week and talking about how I was going to give Dying Light to probably another couple of weeks, and uh, I think just days after, maybe like twenty four hours after that conversation, um, a a the best possible, the most positive spanner that could have been thrown into the works was thrown in uh, when we got sent. Was it a, a, was it a was it a big spanner or was it a tiny spanner? Um, do you know what? I think I think it's a bigger spanner than I expected. Um, in, in, in a world where big, bigger is better when it comes to spanners. I want to establish that narrative right. up front. Um, basically, we sent a code or a key for Tiny Tina's Wonderlands um, uh, on the Epic Game Store. And so I was lucky enough to to take responsibility for that one. And I've played, I'd say, a solid 10 hours or so over the last week just to kind awesome. of uh, get stuck in and get my bearings and because I wanted to be able to come back on the show this episode and and deliver some thoughts. And you know what, Josie? I don't know if this is going to pique your interest as someone who I know didn't really click with Borderlands 3 in the way that you perhaps had with previous entries in the series, but I think Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is actually pretty good. Um, okay, that's good to hear. I, it weirdly kind of grabbed me the last sort of couple of trailers, but I, it's one where I'm definitely still unsure. Yes. Uh, so for full transparency as well... I actually never got grabbed by any of the trailers. And the reason I never got grabbed was because I just found the presence of Tiny Tina and the kind of writing she has given and the kind of performances that Ashley Birch gives, uh, albeit perfect for the character, to be a un- uniquely grating um, presence <laughs> in my life. Um, right. And I just remember what looking at those trailers and saying, do you know what, like a, a fantasy-themed borderlands style game that could be interesting a borderlands game that experiments with elements like melee weapons or magic that could be interesting but at the same time i i just don't know what this is going to give me that feels radically different um and the answer weirdly enough at, at the risk of sounding not just confusing but also contradictory is more than i thought in some respects and less than i hoped for in others okay um, it kind of the pendulum of how much does this feel like Borderlands continued to swing back and forth, uh, basically throughout my let's say the first five to six hours of the game um, until it kind of settled in a rough place. Well, like stylistically, it looks very Borderlands. That's the fundamental thing here, right? And 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 I know it also also makes me want to say up front that while I think some people like yourself didn't necessarily uh, jive with Borderlands three in a way that they'd hoped for. Borderlands 3 didn't do anything fundamentally wrong in the gameplay department. I think that there were lots of uh, justifiable criticisms of the narrative and of the writing, and for example, the the, the you know the presence and just the 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 lack of memorability for when it comes to the antagonists and how they were handled. Yeah. Um, but the f- gameplay fundamentals, the most, the most, I, I think the most negative thing you could say about it, and this is negative to varying degrees depending on your perspective, is that it was just more Borderlands. Um, yes, shooting things felt similar. Character builds and you know exploring those skill trees felt similar. Loot, despite the fact that it was expanded and there were new weapon manufacturers and tons of new weapons, felt similar. It just didn't take that long until you felt you like you were playing Borderlands and you were like, well, hang on a second, why am I doing this again? And I think some people ran into that in Borderlands Three, and 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 again, it kind of comes back to does Tiny Tina's Wonderlands do enough to? to circumvent that issue for people who felt particularly um, bored by Borderlands 3. I think if you were extremely bored by Borderlands 3, the answer is no. But I think if you still have somewhere within you, as I did coming into this, that feeling of like, actually, I fun- I don't fundamentally have any problems with the Borderlands formula. I would be up for shooting things and picking up loot right now. Then I think there's enough fresh in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands um, to to go in on it. Okay. Um, like to, to give you an example of, so when I launched the game, um, so the, the premise for anyone uh, wondering is that uh, rather than being sort of a, a you know a, a big a big sprawling you know uh, planet trotting adventure, uh, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, as the name would kind of suggest, is an in-universe D and D game that is essentially being d- uh, DM'd by Tiny Tina, and you are playing as a basically like an unseen new character on a ship who is in, then in turn role-playing as the character that you create to take part in this Dungeons & Dragons game. Right. Like, like a little uh, note there, in fact, that that also means that this is the first Borderlands game with a character creator, so you are actually choosing you know, your appearance and what you look like and what you sound like and so on and so forth um, for anyone that's interested in that. Um, 
And then because of that, it means that you are transported, as again, people have seen the trailers, into these sort of fantastical worlds. And when I first like landed in one of them, I was like, oh shit, like this is kind of, this looks like, it was, it was almost very um, Tolkien-esque. I almost felt like I was in the Shire. And I was like, this immediately just looks different enough to justify its existence. And then I walked and I got to the first corner and I was like, oh, there's like a safe that's a perfect cube. And I walked up to the safe <laughs> and I pressed square and the safe's door flung open and there was a small bag of coins and the small bag of coins gravitated towards me and I got cash. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a Borderlands game. And I went a little bit further on and... I picked up an axe and all of a sudden my melee attack on the right stick for me because I played on controller was like an axe that actually had its own stats and its own slot in the inventory. And while there were no kind of um, combos or parries or anything like that, there were different animations, like different swings as you were like taking more and more swings at the same enemy. And there were like, it was weirdly satisfying in a way that melee combat had never been before. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then I found a gun, and my gun was like a weird sort of like gun pistol slash crossbow variant that shot um, arrows, basically. And I was like, oh, that's like, that's like a fantasy twist on Borderlands guns. But then I found a second gun, and it was like a combat SMG that looked like it was probably in Borderlands 3. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I found a ward, and it's like, oh, a ward is just the, a different name for the shield. It works in the exact same way. Like, you have a big shield with a certain thingy, and... It goes down and then a certain amount of time will pass and it starts refilling and you know those are the you know various stats determine how quickly it refills and so on. And then I found magic and it's like, oh, they've replaced grenades with magic. But also magic can take a number of different forms. Like, is it a spell that I'm zapping at someone? I got my the second spell I got like brought down a big like asteroid thing that crashed into someone. And then and I know I'm all over the place, but that's because, again, my first four or five hours with this game were this weird, like, p continuous pendulum swings between this feels like a Borderlands game to this feels like a new kind of Borderlands game um, right. with the end result sitting somewhere in the middle. Is it, in a weird way, is it almost like, you remember the first time they started, uh, like Saints Row came out and it felt like it was just a carbon co copy of uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto, but, you know, trying to add a few different elements and then it went its own way. I wonder if, like Tiny Tina, um, at this point feels too much like a carbon copy because it's not only that, you know, it's made by the same people, it's going to feel very mm. similar. But if it might be the start of actually, you know, a new type of game that they can spin off and it can find its own, um, find its own legs and it can sort of go on its own path, which would, which might be nice because from what you've said there, I, I like the sound of it, but at the same time, I don't think I'd, I think like I'd get a little bit frustrated if I kept suddenly thinking, oh, I'm back in Borderlands 3. Like, um, yeah. cause you, you kind of do want something I new and something fresh. I think if you played this game to completion, that would happen. There would come a point where you were like, okay, I've adjusted to the new elements here. I'm playing a Borderlands game. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, if this was successful enough and popular enough to spin off into its own franchise and there was a, a Tiny Tina's Wonderlands 2, then I wouldn't be all that surprised. It does have other some, some strong, stronger stuff going for it. Like I mentioned my disdain for Tiny Tina herself as a character. I will say that the other supporting characters are far more interesting. Um, so at the table, they don't actually have characters that are represented in the D&D world. Um, but at the table, so basically voice, uh, like narrating your experience, are uh, Valentine. I, what's his name, Valentine? I think his name was Valentine, who is voiced by Andy Samberg. And a robot called Fret, who is voiced by Wanda Sykes. And um, there was a... Uh, uh, his, uh, I always forget his name because I get him confused with Will Forte. Is it Will Arnett? Is that the oh, Will Arnett? Yeah, the yeah. Guy Will Arnett in um, Arrested Development. Yes, exactly. He voices the the bad guy. He's called like Lord Dragon or something like that. Which again, so again, like uh, there were definitely times when I wished the script had given those you know people with those kind of comedy chops a little bit more to do. Like there was definitely times where I'm like, there's no way you got Andy Sa let Andy Sandberg like fucking go off the rails and, and ad lib here because he would have come up with something funnier than the shit he's just read for you. Um, right. But at the same time, like they do bring something to the role in a way that like made Borderlands 3's cast of characters immediately more forgettable. Um, right. But then again, also Tiny Tina is still um, a presence. Yeah. Yes. And like, like one of the things about, so there's this ongoing theme through the game where because she's DMing um, and it's, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, and even though you're playing the fantasy, she can determine what happens. 
Um, she can change the narrative and, you know, characters pop in or scenes change dramatically. Uh, there's a thing early on where you're approaching a town and she basically uh, invokes a war just by narrating and then all these different elements come in, as you mentioned them. It's actually pretty well done. Um, but that she is also, also obsessed with this character called Queen Butt Stallion, who is a solid diamond unicorn who saves the day all the time. And, like, again, just... Like I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, like uh, pretentious and pretend I'm above it. But like, I don't need a, a solid diamond unicorn called Queen Butt Stallion. Like, there's no way that you, there's nothing you can write around Queen Butt Stallion that will get me to laugh. It, right, like, see, yeah. this is 2008, Tiny Tina, like kicking in again. Where like Borderlands 2, which was already on the tail end of internet speak, like still thinks some of these things are funny when they're just not. Um, it's funny because I like the, the the way you say like uh, utilizing the, the sort of the tabletop D and D thing where you can sort of say oh then this happened and something you weren't expecting is actually yeah. a really interesting idea in a game um, yeah. to sort of mess with the narratives and mess with the expectations. So I really like the sound of that. So I'd, I I would like to play it. I would like to play um, Wonderlands, but I think I would probably have a lot of the same issues that I think you've said. But it does mm -hmm. make me wonder um, what they could do with a sequel if they felt less. Uh, like if it found its own audience and they could, they felt less compelled to stick with, you know, making it feel so borderlandsy. Um, yeah. Cause I can imagine that that's the sort of stuff that would drag on me a little bit. And, and like you said, if you've got Wanda Sykes, if you've got Andy Sandberg, if you've got um, Will Arnett, those are some uh, great like char um, actors to have to mm. just like let them put their spin on characters and, and give it some humor. So it's, yes, yeah, it's, that's the key thing. It's a bit of like, a shame if they, if they've been sort of reined in quite a lot, but um yeah, yeah, prom it, promising it, it, it sound. sound it, 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 it's still it's still kind of this fifty fifty split between okay that was actually a like above average funny and okay that line was written by the guy who forced claptrap into this game. <laughs> claptrap is in this game. Um, I was going to ask, but I didn't want to annoy you. By he is so f so far he has only popped up in one side mission that wasn't that long, um, and he was his usual self. Um, yeah. The other thing I'll say, because I think, again, it will interest you in just in terms of like elements that are completely new, um, rather than being, you know, one big sort of basically unbroken open world in the way that, you know, some like Borderlands games have kind of experimented with, this mm. game is a lot more sort of compartmentalized into these sort of separate areas, some of which it is still that kind of classic Borderlands thing, which is you'll go to an area, you'll kind of do the, the golden path through it for the story, and yeah. you might go back there for a side mission that takes you off to a side area that you didn't actually go to during the... But basically, those, those areas feel a little bit more smaller and self-contained, and the reason is that there is actually now an overworld map um, like to, okay. so basically you come out of these areas and all of a sudden you're in a thir third person view and it's your character represented as like a almost like a bobblehead style you've got a big head and a small body and you're running around like the, um, what would be like the D&D &D map between areas and like there's there's things oh, right. there like there's like a bottle cap that you have to punch down to use as a bridge over a thing. And there's one part where like a ch like Tiny Tina has dropped a Cheeto onto the board itself so you can't get past an area and you have to... And she kind of like... You accuse her of dropping a Cheeto on it and, and she's like, no, it's a m weird mystical asteroid and she creates a quest that you have to do to get the asteroid to like levitate out and... Like, they play with some of those things. And there are also, like, quests and exploration and things that you do in within the overworld, too. Okay. Which And that kind of breaks the flow up a little bit in a way that I was like, the first time I arrived in the overworld, I was like, oh, wow, this is, again, something that's completely new. Um, which is what this game needed. New. Is, it, is, it full, is it a full-length, full-price game? Full-length, full-price game, yeah. Okay. Um, it does, it sounds like the sort of thing that, after say thirty hours is going to be a bit of a struggle to stay with, but um, hey, you know I could be completely. Like I've, but then I found Borderlands games a struggle to stick with, yeah, um, all the way through. So you know, and that that's where I'd maybe like hesitate to like recommend this to you outright. What I but my my gut reaction to this is that um, I'm enjoying it, and the weird thing is that I, I think I, I enj I've enjoyed my first 10 hours of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands more than I enjoyed more than I enjoyed my first 10 hours of Borderlands 3 in spite of the fact that Borderlands 3 probably should have felt fresher so right. that is yes. a compliment I guess in a roundabout way 
It sounds better than Elden Ring, I'm not going to lie. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Basically, anyone who thought that the uh, the game of the year was already you know, determined, signed, sealed, delivered, you're going to have to reopen those envelopes and recast your ballots because Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is here to stay. But don't and... slap anyone for opening an envelope. No, exactly. Out. Yeah, and, and Randy, Pitchford, when you go up to accept your Oscar, okay, like... For you know, excuse me, your game your game award. Um, remember to thank the devil, because no doubt he played a part in the weird, fucked up black magic you did to be in the position you're in. <laughs> um, hey, Jonesy. Speaking of games that aren't going to be game of the year in 2022, um, sh- can we um, go into the news with by uh, opening on what hopefully will be the the first piece of bad news in like a good news sandwich. Which, by which I mean the bread is two pieces of shit news. Yes, let's do it. Um, the answer is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2, or the as yet unti- untitled sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, because it has been officially delayed. <coughs> <coughs> oh, the Nintendo gods are cursing me, then. My voice has died. What's going on with my voice? I can't, I'm trying to talk about Breath of the Wild 2 and my throat is collapsing. This is what happens every time you try to talk about the delay. Uh, Nintendo have little technology, little little drones that fly around and they stop <clears> being <throat> able to talk. Stop that, telling that, that Genuinely is what it felt like. That felt like the, the moment in a, like a spy movie or a thriller where I was just about to say the name of the rat that's hidden inside the organisation and an unseen sniper shot me in the throat. Um, <laughs> spring 2023, an entire year is how much longer we're going to have to wait until we can actually play or see or even just find out the real name of uh, Breath of the Wild 2. This is, Jones, this is yeah. baffling to me because Nintendo are, I think, usually a company who are, um, you know, are much better than most, um, I would say, at getting games out on time, being realistic about release schedules and stuff like that. They don't usually announce things and, and, and talk about release dates until they're until they're ready to give you a realistic date. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised. A, a full year seems like a hell of a long delay as well. You're right. It's weird. Like, don't get me wrong. There are some like frustratingly notorious examples in the last couple of years of Nintendo not playing by that rule book. Like, it feels like they've become increasingly willing in a, on occasion to break it. As like with Metroid Prime Four, for example. Right. We just like, but at the same time. The, the, I think the reason that what you said holds true is because Nintendo always have that thing of like you watch Nintendo Direct and it's like games we're going to focus on games coming out in the next six months and they'll I'm thinking about the Direct that was like a, a month or two ago and it was like oh they're doing Switch Sports like a full on Wii Sports sequel or they're doing a new uh, Mario Strikers game and it's all coming out really soon it's all coming out this summer and we had no idea it existed they yeah. can announce stuff and release it in two, three, four, five months lead ups in a way that no one else in the industry seems willing or able to experiment with. So, yeah, you're right. When I mean, this was a game that we saw, uh, we last saw in uh, June, uh, for anyone keeping count. So, you know, nine months ago, that was the last time we saw a trailer for it. And even then, it felt a little bit overdue. So now the fact that we could be a whole year away, yeah, I didn't have this on my, on my bingo card either. <laughs> In a Quite weird a- way, though, like if it had been another company making the game, I would have said absolutely it's going to get delayed because it, mm-hmm. because they'd not talked about it. They hadn't released the title. We hadn't seen that much of it. So it did feel like something that wasn't as ready as it was supposed to be. But um, yeah, I am surprised. Well, I'll read the, the statement. So basically the way they did it in you know true Breath of the Wild fashion was there was a video statement from the series producer, Eiji Onuma. Uh, He said, Jonesy, as previously announced, the adventure in the sequel will take place not just on the ground as in the previous game, but also in the skies above. However, the expanded world goes beyond that, and there will be an ever-wider variety of features you can enjoy, including new encounters, new gameplay elements, all to be expected in the sequel. But basically what I'm getting at is I felt like there was more of a focus than I thought there might be in the statement on some of the new gameplay elements, the new mechanics they're experimenting with. Do you think any part of this stems from a fact that they are struggling to implement new features, struggling to differentiate this game from the, its predecessor, or just having development difficulties in general? I know it's hard, hard to speculate, but, you know, I, you, you know what, to, I, yes. I would, I would, I don't think it is probably any of that. I think it's more <clears throat> like, in my mind, it's probably more likely that um, they've just decided that the game would benefit from some more development time. And also, 
Um, you know, let me tinfoil hat it a little bit and say, I wonder if the massive success of Elden Ring and the fact that they're mm. like, Elden Ring is definitely going to be the game of the year, like it's what a lot of people are saying already, and it did 12 million sales, you know, in the first sort of number of weeks or whatever it was, um, in that they're sort of saying, well, we're not going to come out and be second best to Elden Ring that we already know is um, is going to do phenomenally well, but phenomenally well, Jesus, I can't say that word, phenomenally well by the end of the year. And so they've said, do you know what? We could do with a bit more time anyway. Let's push it until spring 23 and then we can be game of the year 23 and we'll get a little bit more time to maybe work on and massage some of these elements a bit. Sure, you know, I, 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 I love the idea that Nintendo think that way because it's so like petty, but and in a way that Nintendo so often seem above the idea that someone at Nintendo is like, no, we have to win game of the year. We can't, re-. or the idea that, you know, the Elden Ring took so many of the Breath of the Wild sort of, you know, design ideas as inspiration and took them and ran with them and made such a good game. Maybe like the idea of, oh, the game that was inspired by us is better than the sequel to, to it. That we were making. That, yeah. Can I throw another tin? Can I throw another theory away? If I ask you to keep that tinfoil hat on just a few moments <laughs> yeah, longer, sure. do you think there's any possibility that when Spring 2023 rolls around and the Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild 2 uh, starts to become a little bit more tangible, there is perhaps also a new skew of the Nintendo Switch that may or may not be right around the corner. Perhaps, say, a 4K enabled Nintendo Switch Pro. Uh, I think that's. I, I I still think that's likely. Yeah, like because because this we what we've been talking about like since how long has it been now? It's been like nearly a year, right? <laughs> that that um, all the weirdness happened where it was like confirmed rumors as a four K switch coming out, and then Nintendo yep. were like, no, it was all lies. You're making it up, and then it was very strange. And so yeah, the theory of or, that we had at the time was no, no, there is going to be a pro, but they've it's actually not coming out yet. And I think, I think you've, you're onto it. I think that's a great shout that the Switch Pro and El, um, I was going to say Elden Ring 2 and uh, <laughs> Breath of the Wild 2 will be uh, coinciding with each other. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know I could absolutely see that. I could absolutely and, see And that. they have absolutely not been afraid, especially when it comes to Zelda. You talk about Breath of the Wild and Twilight Princess, to name but two, to have Zelda games uh, straddle console generations and be like, yeah, you could play Breath of the Wild on the Wii U if you wanted to, but really this is a Switch launch game. Um, they also need to give themselves more, maybe more breathing room around the OLED. Um, and they've said, hey, the OLED's still doing okay, so we, we don't want to um, tell people the Pro's coming out yet because we want to, you know, still sell those new, oh, those yeah. new Switch OLEDs. So maybe they're going to, that's another reason for delaying the Pro if they were going to bring that out a bit earlier, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if, if you're you Nintendo, well you, you don't announce that Pro anytime soon because you just don't need no. to. Almost the same, weirdly enough, with Sony and Microsoft, which is just the, the PlayStation, to hone on them as an example at the moment, because they are selling more units, at least it, it would appear to be uh, selling more units than, than, than Xbox uh, when availability allows. A PlayStation 5 Pro would look weird when they can't get PlayStation 5s on shelves with any real consistency. There's got to still be tens of millions of people out there that just want a regular PS5. Surely, yeah. So, yeah, because, I mean, I think based on the um, based on the timeline of how that all went down, we could be, we, like, we might... I'm trying... Would it be the end of next year that a pro would be due or the end of the year after? I don't know, but... I get, uh, I, I guess the end of 24. It can't be yet. It can't be the end of next year. Surely I think, I think the PS3 was 2013 and the Pro was the end of, I think the Pro might have been the end of 16, which would have been three years. Can I ch- fact check that line? Yeah, yeah, of course. Although, but I think that the, the actual like console generations have gotten wider or further apart though anyway, right? So I don't think it's, I don't think it would be necessarily the same span of time i think maybe an extra year or so wouldn't be that surprising but i think totally. i i completely with you though like i think that'd be madness if they started talking about playstation 5 pro now um i could see them i could see them talking about like a bigger bigger storage um native storage on a playstation 5 i could see that happening but a more powerful playstation 5 i can't see happening no i, Just I agree purely from your your point like how annoyed would you be if they started talking about you know, you can't even get the PlayStation 5, and now they're talking about a PlayStation 5 Pro. Yeah, yeah, and for, exactly, because, like, and, and to, to, to reiterate, like, having just checked it, it was indeed 2016, and yeah, so three years would mean 
would by the by this time next year we'd be talking about are they going to reveal it this summer to launch it in the yeah and you're right that would be crazy and I wouldn't be happy so um I hope you I hope whoever's in charge listens to you is what I'm saying Jonesy voice <laughs> of reason as always um speaking of uh, Sony and the PlayStation they uh, have actually made a few headlines this week by finally uh announcing and revealing the plans for the overhaul to PlayStation Plus that we had been talking about in the uh, in the realm of confirmed rumors for for many many months now and what and was the, thought, what was the working was it Spartacus exactly that yeah Spartacus. Spartacus yeah one of those weird situations where you know between the Jeff Grubbs and Jason Shrives of the world we knew everything about this from its code name to the to the the the, you know, the strands that it would be available the kind of different tiers rather that would be available even a rough sort of guideline for their prices and mm. the the perks they would um, that, that they would include but we now have all the information everything's out on the table and Sony have made it all public um, and I've got to say Jonesy well maybe we'll get into it after we've outlined what's actually on the on the table here but the the response to it has been a little bit strange. And I think part of the reason is actually at the fault of the media, kind of the press. Um, my, my just to, you know, I'm going to do the classic like debate thing where I'm going to put my 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 theory out first before I get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> okay. I think I think too many people, for the sake of uh, making headlines, making the kind of titles for YouTube videos that we make on this show, on this podcast right here. Look out for the one that. Uh, we're going to use for this episode because again it will be clickbaity and it will be the kind of bullshit I'm calling <laughs> out right now um i think too many people saw that calling this sony or playstation's equivalent to game pass was the easy way to connect with an audience and give them something to think about and like and yes. to click on when in fact this is not and never has been a competitor to game pass um yeah agreed um but yeah so to get into what it's actually is for those that missed it the, the simple way to uh, look at this is actually, rather than thinking of it as a new service or some kind of Game Pass competitor, this is a consolidation and, at the end of the day, a rebranding of the services that PlayStation once offered. So, for those of you who didn't know, there was PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. PlayStation Plus was the monthly or fee that you had to pay, well, you could pay it quarterly or annually as well, to essentially get access to playing games online, and there would also be a couple of other perks or benefits to being a PlayStation Plus uh, subscriber as well. For example, free games every month. Um, it's, it's similar to Xbox Live Gold, if you want to look at it on the other side. And then there was PlayStation Now, which was a, a slightly older service that was... In the uh, early iterations, a streaming service that allowed you to play, say, PlayStation 3 games via streaming. Um, and then that service grew a little bit. how I paid bit. Bioshock Infinite. There you go. Uh, and But it did grow a little bit in recent sort of months and years to include a big catalogue of PlayStation 4 games. And those PlayStation 4 games could be downloaded and played locally a la Games Pass. So in some respects, it became the de facto equivalent, but... Um, it never really became the thing that PlayStation tried to position as a Game Pass rival because PlayStation never even hinted at the possibility that first-party titles would arrive on the service day and date. Uh, Sony right. liked to sell games for £70, and they will continue to do so. Um, so basically what Sony have done is they have wrapped up PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now uh, into one thing, basically, uh, and given it three tiers, depending on how much you want to pay. So there's PlayStation Plus Essential, which is uh, in the UK here, it's six ninety nine a month. It'll be, um, which is, or you could pay for it uh, for £50 a year. And it's basically the exact same as PlayStation Plus. So if you're a regular PlayStation Plus subscriber, that's essentially what you're already doing. And that is the service that you'll be moved onto in June when this all rolls out and becomes the new norm. There is a step up from that, which is called PlayStation Plus Extra, which is ten ninety nine here um, per month in the UK, which includes um, a catalogue of four hundred PS four and PS five games to download, including blockbuster hits from our PlayStation Studios catalogue and third party partners. So my again, my reading of that is that PlayStation Plus Extra is essentially PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now wrapped together, but with the catalogue perhaps being slightly embellished. And, and it's kind the, of like the because obviously when the PlayStation Five came out, they had the um, uh, what do they call it? The PlayStation Collection, which was like yes, a, exactly a, a number of downloadable games which you could get. So this is kind of like I suppose that rolled into it as well. But to uh, totally, totally. 
Um, and then there is one more uh, tier above, which is PlayStation Plus Premium. This is the maximum tier, which in the UK is £13.49 per month, uh, which is everything I've already mentioned. But it goes further, adding 340 additional games um, from the PlayStation 1, 2, 3, and PSP. Um, it's worth noting, though, that PS3 games will only be available to stream, so there is still absolutely no local emulation of the PlayStation 3, and classic PS1, 2, and PSP games will be available to stream or download, and in one final perk, there will be time-limited game trials included for players to try before they buy. Um, so That's yeah, like, I like the sound of that. I like the idea of the uh, game trials. You yeah, and also I think the thing about this is because Sony themselves are running the service, right? One of the sort of, you know, the type of game that you can imagine will automatically be included for these time-limited game trials is their first-party output. And look, I don't know how many people will want to play the first two hours of God of War Ragnarok to figure out if they like it or not, but, like, it's nice to know that something like that could exist, um, especially for things you just want to, as, as you said, try before you buy. Um so a few talking points here. One thing I'll say up front is, as I mentioned earlier, this is all happening in June. Everything's transitioning over. This isn't like an opt-in or an opt-out thing. Basically, you will be put into one of these tiers, whether you like it or not, based on what you're already paying for. If you're PlayStation Plus on its own, you'll get put into the Essential tier. If you're PlayStation Plus and, and PlayStation Now, you'll get put into the Plus Extra tier. And if you want to go to Plus Premium, you have to pay more. Um... They've also given us an idea of some of the games that will be included uh, in that catalogue of games of the extra and premium tiers. They've mentioned Death Stranding, God of War, Marvel Spider-Man, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales, Mortal Kombat 11, and Returnal, which just gives you a little glimpse there, kind of like what you were saying, Jonesy, an interesting mix between the PS Plus collection, when you're talking about things like Mortal Kombat 11 and God of War, um, but also Marvel Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Returnal, suggests that, again, first-party Sony titles could perhaps be coming to that catalogue slightly faster than you might have imagined. Nowhere, obviously, no, nowhere near Game Pass Day 1 style, but Returnal, like, less than a year old. Yeah, and, and I think Sony do have a bit of um, history. It was, what I've noticed that, that often when there are games that I want to play um, that I wasn't necessarily going to buy Day 1 and I was thinking, oh, I'll pick them up a little bit later down the line, um, they haven't been very forthcoming when it comes to like adding them to services or making them available or, you know, even lowering prices. Like Sony's marketplaces um, is, is with newer games is often sort of pretty brutal. Not as bad as Nintendo. Like I'm not talking five years of full price, <laughs> but it's, it's often, uh, you know, quite high price for quite a long time. So for my estimations, the, the one of the best things there, as someone who's already got PlayStation now and has got... Um, obviously PlayStation Plus, the idea that I could get my hands on first-party games within, say, I don't know, let's say six months to a year after their initial release. I really like mm -hmm. the sound of that. I think that is <clears throat> that is um, something that I could be tempted with because there are games, and Returnal is one of them, where I, I would love to play it, but I'm not going to go out and buy it at any time now yes. because I'm like, that because I'd then be annoyed if it came on sale somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. But if PlayStation offer me a way to pick up these titles sort of six months to a year down the line, then, um, yeah, that's, that does sound like a good deal to me. I, I'm less bothered about the the backwards compatibility side of it in the sense of, like, PlayStation 1, 2, 3, uh, PSP. That's not something which is going to sort of... I mean, rarely do I ever want to play games that are that old. Um, mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes, but... But no, but it makes sense that they're sort of dragging these two things together and they're updating their... Um, updating their offering. I don't think it's a com it's a competitor to Xbox Game Pass. Like you said, it's not a day one thing. It's not going to have... I can't imagine anytime soon they're going to buy up any studios specifically to get the titles on there like right, day exactly. one like Xbox do. Um, but hey, it seems like it's a, it's going to add some um, quality of life stuff and it's going to add some elements to PlayStation fanboys like myself. So I'm, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sounds good. No, I agree. I agree. It, it, it almost feels like... Uh, I don't know if it's a branding issue or a communication issue, issue, but PlayStation Now started to feel like a bit of a weird thing where mm. I remember trying to explain it to a friend of mine who wasn't particularly, you know, in touch with subscriptions that you paid for within, you know, various gaming live services. Um, and explaining to him, like, no, you, you pay £7 a month and you just download that game and you play it. Like, there was a weird sort of, like, difficulty there where some of the... The, the the actual like benefits to a service like PlayStation now weren't that easy to communicate 
And I think rebranding and consolidating and getting away from, well, almost entirely getting away from all the streaming stuff and just saying like, no, trust me, just go for this plus extra tier and download any of these 400 games the same way you would have if they were in the collection, as you mentioned earlier. Hopefully um, bridges the gap uh, for Sony in a way they couldn't before. But beyond that, I, again, I completely agree that this is sort of a, a rebranding and a consolidation. It's Sony simplifying and streamlining the services they they provide um, and maybe kind of sweetening the deal a little bit in the early stage to try and encourage people where possible to bump up from just, you know, the essential package to the plus extra package. And I, I also, also completely agree. Sorry. Oh, no, go on. What are you going to say? I was just also say, I also completely agree that Returnal for me is almost the poster boy for this, you know, the catalogue at the moment because it was a £70, felt like a lot of money to gamble on a game like Returnal this time last year where like the Metacritic is in like the 80s, which is solid, but apparently it's really difficult and it's a roguelike. It, it, it's that classic game like both, hey, I don't want to pay full price for this or hey, I want to try it before I buy it. It actually ticked both those boxes, you know? And so I yeah, can see absolutely. why they've thrown it in here. I also think the this idea is um, is good. Um, the, you know, it, it's almost because what they can do, rather than like a Game Pass thing, whereby, you know, like, oh, play all your new games here. It does take the Game Pass box in the sense of um, this is another option for people that look at Sony's, um, you know, their PlayStation 5 and says, hold on, you want me to spend however much on the PlayStation 5 and then you want me to spend 80 quid on uh, a new game when it comes out. And if I'm doing that three or four times a year, like that is a lot of money you're asking me yep. to invest. Whereas if you say, look, buy a PlayStation 5 um, and you've got your initial outlay, then all you've got to do is pay your £15 a month or whatever it is, um, you know, for the for the top tier and you're going to get hold of um, a lo whole loads of games, hundreds of games, and you're going to be playing PlayStation 5 games, you know, like a number of months after they come out and you can get that um, try before you buy. I think it is probably something that's going to appeal to um, people that want a PlayStation 5 but are scared off by the, you know, the massive financial investment that you have to pay in this current generation. I think it is, mm. it's a viable thing that you can say, £15 a month, I can afford that. What is that? It's like two McDonald's's. I can afford that and I can afford the initial outlay. So I'm never going to buy a PlayStation 5 or, you know, a PlayStation 4 game again. I'm just going to rely on the um, the uh, PlayStation's, what, what are they actually calling it? Have they said what the name for it is going to be? This uh, for for uh, it, I mean, really, they're, they're, it's all still PlayStation Plus. It's just PlayStation. So it's, it's because like, PlayStation Plus Essential, PlayStation Plus Extra, PlayStation Plus so Premium. Oh, right, okay. so, so Plus it, is still the you know the main focal point. So you could absolutely go into a shop and go, I, I can afford the PlayStation, and I can afford to get um, PlayStation Plus Premium monthly, and hmm. you know, and pay. You could even pay for it the two together in a bundle, and you pay an extra hundred quid. But then you've got hundreds of games to play. Um, you know, you know, you're going to get some new games in the year, whatever. Yeah. On PlayStation Five. Not a bad, not a bad little package. A couple of thoughts to pick your brain on while uh, while we're here, though. We're, uh, we're talking about a catalogue of 400 PS4 and PS5 games. Not a small offering in the slightest. It's that's actually more than I expected. One of the things, though, that it's easy to overlook, especially when we're talking about slightly older games or smaller games, games from independent studios. No game ever on planet earth falls into a catalog like that some piece of business is being done someone's signing something and whether you know sony are paying them or not you know we never uh, we're not going to know the specifics but clearly business is being done to accumulate a catalog like that obviously i agree with you that sony are never going to go out and acquire studios with the express purpose of populating a catalog like this or moving in the direction of uh, day and date releases um within the the kind of the downloadable ca uh, catalog of games but could you see them going out and cutting deals and spending money on uh game to get games that are maybe again it's similar to returnal but on the third party side like i'm just looking at the floor here and like i'm seeing like far cry 6 and resident evil village like the, the couple of two boxes of games I've got on the floor next to me. Like, could you see Sony going out and saying, actually, we're going to approach Capcom and spend $2 million to get Resident Evil Village in the catalogue? It's not day and date. It's not, we, we don't own the IP. We're not, you know, we're not doing any weird business. We're just, we're going to spend money to make this worth money. I could do, I don't know to that level. Like, I, mm -hmm. I can't imagine because I think the time frames probably wouldn't work. I can't imagine that they're going to say adding in Resident Evil Village, you know, 
a year and a half, two years or whatever it is after the fact, I can't, you know, they're going to drop two million quid in it because they're going to say, well, that's not going to get anyone else to sign up. So what would be the point? I could see them doing what I think they did with PlayStation Now, which was doing deals whereby they would take entire collections from studios or publishers to uh, fill out like the back catalogue. So games that are older, like, you know, four years old or five years old. I could see them, for example, um, putting all of the... Uh, you know, something like the Arkham games, just saying, hey, every Arkham game has mm-hmm. just been loaded into it. Um, so, m- m- Village is a little bit too new, but yeah, I could see them well, doing a deal of Capcom for maybe the the Resident Evil uh, games. Actually, no, yeah, no. Do you know what? I could see them doing all of the Resident Evil games on a deal. Right. And not, Village is included. Village. No, but, oh, okay. And then if Village was included, because then I suppose they could say, um, you get all of these, and then they use that as a selling point to say, and right. all of the Resident Evil games well, are in there. I could yeah, be, so actually, well, I could. I could. The, I the reason I ask is, position. again, because well, while we're being careful to make it clear that this isn't a Game Pass competitor, that catalogue still obviously has to appeal to people. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw the story in the last week, but it came out that um, to get Guardians of the Galaxy on Game Pass, which, of course, Guardians of the Galaxy critically acclaimed and only came out around well, five months ago. It came out in October, I think. Um, the, the speculation is that Microsoft paid 5 to $10 million dollars to get Guardians of the Galaxy on Game Pass. and See, what's like, weird about that I think is different because the weird thing about Guardians and, and Game Pass is I could see people going out and getting on their PC and signing up to Xbox Game Pass purely to play Guardians. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think the difference is I don't see that happening with PlayStation. Maybe because the accessibility is different and it seems mm-hmm. more like a... Maybe you would. I don't know. It just seems more like a... It seems less likely, whereas I can see people going, I can drop seven ninety nine on Game Pass just to play a new one game they've added. If that makes sense, yeah, no, that, that, that that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Um, and, and and I think that also backs up the point that I don't think Sony are necessarily trying to position position any of these uh, the tiers of this service as that kind of a um, you know a deal for the gamer. Like this isn't yeah. a kind of thing where you see a big game arriving on PlayStation Plus Premium this month. And you're like, well, I've got a sub. It's like, this is just the thing you already did. This is PlayStation Plus. This is one of the almost the essentials, as you know, to use their own uh, their their own wording of the PlayStation experience. We've just sort of sourced it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Which um, it, maybe it will develop into that. Maybe it will develop into more of a Game Pass thing if they are if it is actually successful and loads of people sign up to it maybe they do start to do deals where they spend a bit more money to get like, you know, individual titles on there um, if they think it's worthwhile. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I don't know why, but I just can't see it happening in the same way with PlayStation. With, because maybe because the barrier to entry seems different. Like you can get Game Pass on your PC and every, you know, everyone who's yeah. got a laptop or a PC can join in as well. Um, mate, so I think, I think that's probably the difference. We'll see. It's going to be interesting to see how the service develops and sort of what, um, where, where where different uh, kinds of consumers and different kinds of gamers end up sort of falling within this sort of bigger picture? Because, I mean, personally, I actually don't know yet where I'm going to go. I think the premium stuff doesn't offer much to me, but maybe Plus Extra is like, maybe that this consolidation is what I needed to actually pay for PlayStation Now, having not done that for the last God knows how many years in a row. I think the, the backwards compatibility stuff is is nice in theory. I just, I don't, I need to see what the execution is like, and the fact that I feel like the the dream of one day having some form of native PS3 emulation still appears to be as dead as anything. <laughs> like that's a bummer because there are so many great PS3 games that I want to play, and the idea that on a PS5 I'm still streaming them doesn't do much for but me. What about if the streaming is massively improved from how? Because it wasn't great on now, but it wasn't like like I said. I played the I played. Um, Bioshock Infinite, like all of it, yeah. effort to completion on on streaming, and it wasn't perfect, but it was nowhere near as bad as I but thought it would be. the The issue that they've got, and this is just maybe a me problem, and not going to apply to the vast majority of consumers, but I can emulate PS3 games pretty darn well at this point on my PC. Like our PC S3 has been developing and and improving uh, hugely over the over the re- over recent months and years. And again, you know, you have to be careful talking about emulation because it usually sits side by side with piracy, and obviously, we don't want to um, be seen to promote piracy on a product like this. Um, but again, if you if you if you can legally figure out, 
you'll figure your way around the RPCS3 situation. Like the idea of turning on my PlayStation 5 and like streaming Mafia 2 or like streaming 50 Cent Blood in the Sand. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to, not going to do that. There are, diff- there are there are other better ways to play those games in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, with the exception, ironically, of 50 Cent Blood in the Sand, which is, I mean, you know, we, we I don't need to take us down the 50 Cent rabbit hole because we'll be here all night. But all I'm saying is, like, remake it, basically. <laughs> I'm going to become one of those people. Remake this now. That's my demand. Um, Hey, Jonesy, you know earlier when I described the news stories that we we're going to cover as kind of like a weird sort of, like, a good shit new sandwich. sandwich. Good well, new like sandwich. A good new sandwich where the bread is shit. Right. Yes. Um, that would like, imply. Ah, yeah. Because I see what you. Because normally you call it a shit sandwich just because you have the good things on the outside and then you have the shit yeah. in the middle. Yeah. We had the kind of good thing in the middle and the shit on the outside. But the weird thing is now that we're approaching the end of this podcast, I actually don't know that this news is shit so much as it's like irrelevant. And uh, this is starting to feel more and more like an open face sandwich that we've already eaten. And th- this thing, next thing is just like the crumbs that are left on the plate. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And that's the news that kind of broke, um, literally just a matter of hours before we started recording, that E3 2022's digital event, which for anyone that was keeping track is the only form of E3 that was remaining this year, has now also been officially cancelled according to an email that is being sent to various industry partners and i believe that literally just before we hit that red button and started recording the esa did indeed make a statement in fact i know they did because i've got quotes from it that i'm going to read in a second um so yeah it was confirmed in january that the physical version of the event was cancelled for the third year in a row for anyone uh keeping count uh, the planned digital equivalent, which I believe we did get some form of last year, which is why we did feel did feel like we were getting streams and that kind of semblance of a you know that summer kind of press conferencey vibey action was actually kind of taking place. Um, that is not going to happen this year. There's going to be no E3 2022 in any way, shape, or form. I Gut what did we say? Jersey. Do you remember? I can't remember originally what we said when they cancelled the um, the physical. The first time they cancelled the physical show because of COVID, I think we said at the time like we we didn't think it would ever come back. Um, yeah, and I think the, the the digital show was it was kind of an odd prospect anyway. Um, you know, it ticks some boxes, but then obviously with the whole summer game fest thing, I think we we we've talked before about how it was the beginning of the end for E three. Um, yeah, because why you know you, at least with E three in a physical capacity and you go to LA and you've got the actual show there, you already had the studios would pop up around the town and do their own little thing. And it was only a matter of time when it was the digital side. Um, <laughs> my dog is coming and shouting at me. Okay. Sorry. What, 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 what does she think about E3? Uh, she's annoyed. That's why she's shouting. Cause she's saying ah, uh, she, she liked E3. But no, I think, I think, I think we said that, you know, it was the beginning of the end and why would companies be tied to E3, especially why would people pay, um, to have their stuff associated with the digital E3 um, when you can just start to do things on your own. And I think Jeff Keighley with his Summer Game Fest has shown now that um, you can kind of have a summer of love around gaming and it doesn't have to be done with E3. It can be done independently and it can be done all over the internet. And as long as there are people, you know, keeping it like or, or telling you where to go and what to watch, it works pretty well. So um, yes. I'm I'm sad. I We've been to E3 um in physical in real life irl um mm-hmm. and the idea that maybe it's never going to come back in any form is a bit rubbish well but it's worth it's worth noting that the esa as you perhaps expect are being somewhat resilient in the face of um the cancellation of e3 2022 saying we will devote all our energy and resources to delivering a revitalized physical and digital e3 experience next summer whether enjoyed from the show floor or your favorite devices, the 2023 showcase will bring the community, media, and industry back together in an all-new format and interactive experience. Um, if they manage, which, like, if they yeah. manage to pull that off, if they manage, if they do a physical event and a digital event, and the two come together like really well, yeah. And this this year is a sacrifice because they're trying to get ready for next year. What do you would you what do you would you think to that? Because well, I would be I'd be cool with that. Would I be cool with it? Fundamentally, yeah, it's fine. Like, if the ESA want to do a thing or they open the door up for people to come and stream within a certain window, that's great because 
I don't really care which banner it falls under. What I liked about E3 was that there was this one closed off week where things happened. You know, you woke up on any given day, you know, Sunday through Thursday or whatever the fuck it was, and there was a press conference that day or there was a stream that day. And even as companies broke off and began doing their own things that just happened to happen within that week, I liked that structure and I liked having that week to look forward to. There is a bit of sentimentality, like you said, around the physical idea of an E3. You know, like having been to LA and, you know, you know, been to some of these shows live. Yeah, I would I would miss that. But I was also proved wrong last year. I remember in 2020, where, you know, obviously the first year we really had to adapt to the pandemic. I remember th- saying throughout that all these companies, especially the likes of uh, Sony, Microsoft to a certain extent, EA, Ubisoft, and so on and so forth, were all getting uh, better and better at putting on their own events, and were all getting more and more uh, evidence to suggest that when they ran their own streams, it didn't make a difference. They could do their own thing at their own pace and their own time in the calendar, their own slot where they wanted to be in the miss in the mix or as far away from it as possible, and it still worked. People would tune in, and we all sat there during lockdown and watched those Ubisoft forwards and PlayStation State of Plays and Nintendo Directs, and everyone was peeling off in their own direction. E3 kind of came back in 2021. The ESA said, hey, who wants to be a part of E3? And more people said yes than I thought. And don't get me wrong, E3 last year was a bit of a shit show, and there were definitely days where people woke up, looked at the calendar, and were like, oh, cool, like this company's got a thing today and they tune into that live stream and like, this is a recruitment video that's two hours long and they haven't announced a single game. Um, some of that cut, need, some of that fat, excuse me, needed to get cut or trimmed in the least. Um, it needed work, but that experience made me believe that for as long as the ESA are willing to put money into a show that is called E3 that takes place in June and has a physical presence in, let's say, Los Angeles for the sake of argument, and also has a significant digital presence because of the cachet of what the E3 means, because of the E3 name, because of the fact that I can point to people I know in my personal life who have heard of E3 and know what E3 is and don't know if it's happening or not. They will completely, like, that they won't be aware that E3 doesn't happen this year, but if you tell them it's happening next year, they'll know what it is and they'll watch, if that right. makes sense. Yes. I think for as long as that's the case... E3 can still exist. They just need to take a really long, hard look at themselves when they talk about revitalizing the experience and, uh, again, to use their own wording, an all-new format. That's the part they really need to think long and hard about and make it make sense for the people they want to tune in, the people they want to be there physically, and for the partners they want to get on board. Because this is also, as you mentioned, another year for Jeff Keighley to flex his muscles to run the Summer Game Fest. He announced just minutes after E3 uh, cancelled its digital event, that there would be a live kickoff event as a part of Summer Game Fest. So Keeley's going to be the first person on the scene when it comes to, hey, here's a big live stream for everyone to watch full of trailers and world premieres. Um, the, more, the more of that territory you, you let him encroach on, the harder it is going to be to claw it back the year afterwards. So yeah, definitely a tough spot for the ESA, but I'm not, av- I'm not opposed to it existing in 2023 and being something. I just don't know what. <laughs> So I, I I do prefer the month uh, of like summer game fest where you know and things spread out a little bit more. I know what you mean about that week. It can be it's quite exciting. It's high octane. There's new. There's constantly stuff going on, and you can hear you know loads of stuff every day. But yeah. I I always found myself getting a little overwhelmed. Like there was so much going on, and I quite liked the sort of six weeks to a month that summer game fest sort of housed things in. It feels there was time to breathe, which I quite liked. But then you never went too many days without something happening. It was only it was like a few days, and before an indie dev or another big dev would do something. Um, but I do, I, but I really do like the idea of maybe sort of like a bigger integrated E three week where it's digital and it's physical. Uh, you know, we're getting into metaverse territory and VR and stuff, and and there sh- it would be cool if there was some kind of crossover. Like, if you could go to E3 that was physical, but you could go there digitally, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, with game streaming services and things these days and more stuff being on demand, like, and, you know, being able to get access to stuff immediately... I like the idea that maybe if they manage to come up with a cool way of, of reaching more people, then yeah, then I'd, I'd be definitely up for E3 coming back in sort of like a mixed capacity uh, 2023. So, Do you know what, Jonesy? I think every time I uh, am able to talk to you and, and share this uh, podcast with you, I expect interesting, if not hot takes. 
that was uh, the, um, going the metaverse direction on E3 was perhaps the last thing I had on my bingo sheet for this uh, <laughs> for this recording. But I love it, and I do you know what? Definitely, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy an Oculus Quest two just in time for E3 2023, and I'm gonna be there, quote unquote, in person. Oh, I, I I'll meet you there, mate. I'll meet you there. Um. Just trying to think if there's anything else to add. I mean, like, like, let me let me let me wrap this up with one question because again, like Jeff Keeley's presence is is hard um, not to to bring up in this context. You mentioned him earlier. I mentioned him earlier. We said that he has confirmed he's going to have a kickoff uh, event for Summer Game Fest. He's obviously going to run that calendar where he gets to claim that every single you know live stream and press conference that happens within the summer period technically falls under the Summer Game Fest umbrella, even when it doesn't. I love that he does that. It's great. Yeah. Oh, it's genius. Do you think there's any possibility that Keeley claws back more ground this summer than the ESA can take back themselves the summer afterwards? Or do you think this battle even needs to take place? Or do you think it exists in Keeley's head? I don't think there's a battle. Like I, I think like I think you nailed it. Like he anything that happens in the in that time frame of Summer Game Fest, you'll go to the the website Summer Game Fest and Keely will be there and he'll have a little schedule with a calendar that tells you when everything is that's happening in Summer Game Fest and in 2023 E3 will be smack bang right in the middle of Summer Game Fest and Keely will be doing a uh, pre-show he'll be doing a post-show they'll have people on stage to talk about, and you know it will be the same thing they'll just roll e- um, E3 into their own uh, they'll cover it they'll, they will they won't even miss a beat um, yeah I should say that let's put the tinfoil hat on one more time I, I think love it. I don't think Jeff, Jeff Keighley really exists <laughs> he's an illusion I, or, no, I, I think he's, he's an one- avatar okay or whatever you'd call like and he's he's AI I reckon he's an AI or he's, he's a construct an, He's a construct. You know those things where the, you ever see those adverts on Twitter where it says like this person doesn't really exist and it's like a, a deep, deep uh, fake of like yes. not a deep, you're like a fake person that they've managed to. But I think that's what Jeff Keeley is, um, and I think maybe 2023 will be the year that they announce that Jeff Keeley is an AI and he's fully interactive. He's passed the Harding test, not the Harding <laughs> test, the Turing test. Harding test is something different. Um, he's passed the Turing test and. And that is why he's so successful and Summer Game Fest is so successful. And it will be the first year that the audience can vote to choose his footwear themselves and they can update it in <gasps> oh. real time. Um, See, you've multiple taken this types from, of footwear. You've taken this from like a conspiracy theory to something I actively want. That's where we, we've been. Microtransactions for Summer Game Fest presenting E3 and you can pay to change Keeley's footwear on the fly. Yeah. And, and as is often the case with our bleak dystopian futures, Hideo Kojima predicted it. He made him a hologram in Death Stranding, and, and what do you know? There he you was go. never real to begin with. Um, I I'm, would like him to wear those goldfish heeled boots that Jonah Hill uh, tries to sell to the <laughs> eBay store in uh, 40-Year-Old Virgin, is it? It is 40-Year-Old Virgin, yeah. That's the boots I would like him to be wearing. It's like the the not the, the the not quite eBay eBay store. It's like we buy your we sell stuff your on, stuff. No, we sell yeah. your stuff on eBay. Yeah, yeah, but they won't. Oh, he buy- wants to buy them. He doesn't want to sell them, is he? He wants to buy them. <laughs> yes, and she won't let him bu- just buy them there. He's like, I'm holding the things I want. I'll give you the money. <laughs> She's like, I That's don't not understand why why you're making this so difficult. <laughs> I just I, want I, to buy these. Was boots. that like his first thing? Was that before Superbad or was that after? That must no, have been before Superbad. I think it was after Superbad. Oh I'm, I'm, I think I'm on team before. I think I that was. After. I think I think that was secretly uh, Jonah Hill's sort of um, his first uh, first major on screen appearance. Right. Let's what, what, Super what, what, Bad was 2007. Forty year old Virgin was way before 2005. That. Do you right. want to know how? I, do you want to know how it was before that? Because I first saw the poster. 40-year-old virgin, when I was going to the cinema to see uh, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Wow. And I remember right. saying, oh, look, it's a poster. It's a 40-year-old virgin. Was that the Jonah- last film that Sam Worthington was in? That was, no, that was pre-Sam Worthington. That was the that was the third Terminator film, so that was still Arnie. Oh, oh right, okay. And uh, Sam Worthington was that... Um, Salvation. Salvation with Christian Bale. Right, yes. And then, and then it was... Then there was Genesis with a Y was in there somewhere. I forget them all though. Um, bit of Jonah Hill trivia that I found out earlier today on Wikipedia as I was looking up the the Batman. 
Um, I didn't realise that Jonah Hill was at one point in negotiations to star in the Batman as either um, the Penguin or the Riddler. It hadn't actually been determined yet which one he wanted to do, but he was in a conversation with both of them. One of the sticking points, he demanded a salary or asked for a salary of $10 million, which would have been more than triple what Robin Pattinson was being paid to play Batman. Pattinson took, got three. That's not a lot. That seems like I'm surprised that Pattinson only got three. It do, yeah, you're right. It doesn't seem like much. But then I don't really know what standard Hollywood uh, actor rates are. I, me either. Like so it, it's very strange when you find out who the most best paid actors are. It's it's bizarre people. Like it's obviously comedy. It's often comedy actors. It'll be like Will Ferrell was the highest paid actor in one year yeah, or something like, exactly. weird like that. Exactly. I know that like con- big contracts on long running series helped because um, Robert Downey Jr was making him big Marvel money for a good right. couple of years there. Um, what, that helps. There, something, uh, there was something weird, like the the friend, the cast of Friends were making like over a million an episode at one yes, point. Yes, I believe like, that's In the it. last year. I, and I think that Pattinson happens only gets lot. three mil for, a, for a, an entire Batman film. I, I'm, uh, I, look, I don't know if this is accurate or not because it's on a website called go, called gobankingrates.com forward slash net worth. <laughs> Um, of course. But I'm looking at um, the highest paid movie roles of all time. Um, this can't be accurate. There's no way this is accurate because this. Wait. I hope it is now based on your reaction. No, because there's some stuff here that just doesn't make sense. Like this is saying that Keanu Reeves got, Keanu Reeves got paid 66.25 million. For the Matrix Resurrection. Like, there's no way that Keanu Reeves is getting paid like more than 20 times Robert Pattinson. I think there is, but I don't think there is for more Matrix Resurrections. Like Sandra Bullock, 70 million for gravity. Like Sandra Bullock's a great actress and she, you know, she's got she's a big name. But if you're making gravity of all films, you don't need to spend that much of your budget on Sandra Bullock, do you? Yeah, I think that's bollocks. That sounds far too much. Oh, apparently. So apparently, that was that. Okay, so th- now we're getting into the nitty gritty. There's sort of a box office gross share and and film rental gross share and percentages oh, so if they from TV percentage. and ancillary review. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, right. Um, so if they agreed like uh, point naught point two percent in their contract, then it would try and work out and like that in. Apparently, apparently, Bruce Willis negotiated for seventeen percent of the Sixth Sense's global box office gross plus additional rights to its home video sales, uh, and as a result. Uh, Bruce Willis has made one hundred and fifteen million dollars uh, through the Sixth Sense. But that's um, like um, if you if you go by that sort of uh, way of doing it, the the is it Harrison Ford and um, no, is it not Harrison Ford? Uh, the uh, Luke from Luke, what's it? I can't remember the actor's name. The guy who played Luke Skywalker um, ha- agreed like a percentage. Um, and Carrie Fisher did as well for when they were in Star Wars, and they they were they got like two hundred and fifty million based on you know just mm. over the years of all the merchandising and all the net stuff attached to Star Wars. Oh, uh, see again, like I, I, I've now I'm now looking at it on Wikipedia, and so yeah, apparently Keanu Reeves for this is the highest earnings for a single production, and because the Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions were considered a single production because they were shot back to back, Keanu Reeves when you include his sort of back-end things that he made and other bits of compensation, made $156 million through The Matrix. Wow. And had, a, but had an upfront salary of 30, so essentially 15 ten million times, per film. Ten times what Pattinson got. Crazy. Tom, oh, no, Tom, 15 million per film. 15 million per film in right. terms of just salary, yeah. Tom Cruise also, unsurprisingly, was apparently getting paid $100 million per movie during the early noughties. Jesus. Um, License to print money. Yeah. Anyway, um, that was a weird tangent that I didn't mean to go on, <laughs> to go down right at the end of the podcast, but that is um, it for news, which means that's it for the podcast. Uh, so I do, do just want to say, Jonesy, thank you very much. I've got to say, uh, you know, not to kind of like, you know, put it all out in the open, but prior to recording, you know, you're still on the mend. You're still on the road to recovery. Um, you weren't sure if you were going to have the, you know, the, the energy or the, or the or the gumption to 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 put in a shift for the entirety of a two-hour long podcast. But you made it. We are just shy of the two-hour mark. Nice. And I've got to say, you have been a a sterling co-host. Uh, Thank you, and, mate. Um, it's great to have you back in the hot seat, and hopefully, um, 
back to here to stay from here on out, right? Hopefully, yeah. Unless unless something unless something goes drastically wrong again in the next week, which, to be honest, I won't I won't say it won't happen. I mean, <laughs> but, hey, you, know, you never we'll know. See. But hey, I'm going to keep fingers and toes crossed that you're back here next week and Hell that yeah. Chris is back here next week as well, and we can actually get a full house podcast for the second time in. I'm going to say two months. That would be amazing. uh, Crazy to say out loud. Um, But yes, thank you, Jonesy. And thank you at home for watching and or listening along all all the way through this. um, You know what? I was about to say tumultuous episode, but actually I feel like reflecting on it now that we've reached the end, we actually did a pretty okay job. This didn't feel too messy. I'm not slurring my words. Um, (laughs) My eyes don't feel too heavy. I don't know how red they look, but like, I think we're okay. Shall we leave the folks at home with a uh, a bit of a uh, a secret passcode that they can leave in the comment section down below if they made it up to this point? Oh yeah, I don't know what though. I was thinking of maybe we could like combine a few different elements of the the what we talked about today. I, I do kind of want to make it at least partially Will Smith related. Um, <laughs> one idea that popped into my head was that they could put um, at your highest moment, be careful. That's when Jeff Keeley comes for you. Oh okay. uh, yeah, it could do. Little re- just a little remix with generation remix. What did you have any uh, any thoughts? I was thinking, um, what, what about instead of the uh, the famous meme of the, the guy saying, "How can she slap?" What about if it's just, "How can Will slap?" How can how how can Will slap? Yeah, I, I'd like I like almost like to see people type it in the way it's said. How can Will slap? Sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're perfectly encapsulated there by Jonesy. That's a great shout. Um, So yeah, there you go. Leave that in the comment section down below to let us know that you made it all the way to the end of this recording. And then we will be grateful for that. Um, But we're we're just grateful in general. Thank you so much. And uh, hey, if you are watching on YouTube, as a reminder, you can subscribe down below. You can leave a comment. We're going to pick one of them out as a comment of the week uh, in the next episode. So if you want your opportunity, your time to shine, a little moment of the spotlight, that's exactly how you can do it. And a reminder that, hey, wherever you are, like the video, subscribe, ring the bell, just do all those good, like nice, socially engagey stuff because it all helps us out in the long run. And once again, I will plug uh, patreon.com forward slash super show because that is how we keep this operation functional um, despite how barely function it may at times seem. <laughs> um, just imagine how much worse it would be if it weren't for the patronage we received on there. So thank you all so much once again for watching and or listening. Remember, come back same time, same place next week for more gaming news and action and sex. Um, that last part is actually optional. We'll wait and see. You'll have to be there next week. Um, all right. Bye. See ya.